Hey, Trev, how are you, mate? We're here once again, you and I. I am good, Mark. Thanks. How are you doing yourself, mate? Yeah, brilliant, mate. Good to see you up so early in the afternoon. It's actually excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and linking back <laughs> to the fact that, well, <laughs> stop it. Well, there's a lot of good information out there, though, as we know about, you know, working safely during COVID-19. You know, some of the things we're going to look at, I know you'll come on to it a bit more, but everybody's looking at the dynamic risk assessments, et cetera, et cetera, themselves. But there is an opportunity, isn't there, to look at the bigger issue and the bigger framework of training programs? Oh, I, I, I think so, yeah. You know, um, I, I was looking at a thread on, I think it was on LinkedIn the other day, and there was a discussion going on about, you know, online training and tick box training and how it can't replace, you know, face to face training. And, you know, I, I agree with all that. But one of the comments was interesting because it said, oh, you know, people are cutting back now on training courses and they, they want their courses to be shorter. And, you know, that's not a good thing. But actually, you know, I think this is a, a real good opportunity to look at the, the economy of scale, if you like, and the efficiency of training. Because one of the things that we've been quite progressive with, and I know you have as well, is looking at training programs and cutting back to the stuff that they, they really need as opposed to the stuff that they don't need, you know. And I think this is an ideal opportunity. Well, can I just come in on that point then? Because as we know, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of respected programs out there, aren't they? Which range from, you know, somewhere, I think it's something like maybe three weeks, possibly longer in some instances, down to, I know you, you certainly, your programs are five days. Yeah, and yeah we're talking yeah. about restraint training, instructors courses, for example, just so everyone's yeah. clear on that. You know, yeah. Some are three, some are five days, but I suppose really a question what I think I'd like to ask, and maybe, you know, other people would be interested to know is that, how is it then that you're able to deliver your program within five days and cover the needs of an organizational training company. Well, it's, it's interesting that because we actually had someone come and train with us, Pal Kesh. Oh yeah, yeah. Pal Kesh Narba, who he does a safety pod, brilliant guy. Mm -hmm. And when we were you know, getting to know each other I, I, and he was developing, he developed this pod, I said, look, you need to go and look at other systems of restraint to look at how people you know, can, can use the pod. And I said, why don't you come uh, and take part in our restraint instructors program? And he actually asked a question. He said, how long is it? I said, it's five days. Right. He said, how on earth can you, you train an instructor in five days? And he couldn't get it in his head. I mean, yeah. after the course, and there's a video uh, out there that he did for us very kindly. After the course, he was blown away by it. And he went, actually, he says, your, your training is so efficient and to the point that, that you know, I, can, I get it now. I can understand that there's a lot of stuff that we actually don't need to teach. And this goes back to a couple of principles that, that I work with. So I'm just going to share my screen with everyone. And this is the Pareto principle. It's known as the 80-20 rule. Right. And, you know, as people know, and as you know, apart from doing the restraint stuff and the use of force stuff, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated with marketing. I'm fascinated with human psychology. I've, I've studied NLP and quantum mechanics. Now the brain works and all that sort of stuff. From the, from the military part, you know, when I came out, you know, the Navy, one of the things that we used to look at, as I know you did as well in the Army, is you look at your training program or you look at your, you know, whatever your SOPs are, and you're thinking, how can we make these more efficient? You know, yeah. how, in the same way, you know, if you're going to combat, you don't want to carry kit that's not necessary to carry because it slows you down. So and this is one of the things that I started looking at when I came out. And this is a principle that I, I use. It's called the Pareto mm -hmm. principle. For those that don't know it, you know it very well. It's the 80-20 rule. Yeah. But if you look at a business, for example, you know, 80% of sales come from only 20% of, of the customer base. Right. You know? And lots of businesses waste a lot of time going out and trying to get new customers in and get new customers in, where if they actually looked after their customer base they've already got, they'd probably make more money. Yeah. You know, and by the same token, you know, 80% of our results, you know, which is a proven scientific socioeconomic rule, you know, come from 20% of our efforts, which means during our day, if we don't plan our day properly, we can spend 80% of our time doing stuff that's non-productive. You know, and I know a load of people that do that stuff, you know, and here's an interesting statistic. Um, you know, did you know that 80% of traffic only runs on 20% of roads? I wasn't aware of that, to be honest. Was no, no I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's quite staring when you read that. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, really? And, and if you look at a, a house that you live in, think about this, you know, 80% of your time is actually spent primarily in 20% of the rooms in your house. Yeah, I, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. Yes. I mean, unless you live in a one-bedroom flat, of course, you know, that's a bit different. Yeah. 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 But if you take this into training, mm -hmm. I started to look at this back in the day. And I've got to be honest with you, I've got to thank Pete Boatman for this. You know, Pete, Pete was a, a leading light in this stuff. You know Pete really well. And he was always very progressive, you know, yeah. always very inventive, always creative and looking at stuff. And he never stood still. You know, where other people said, this is the training program that's set in stone, Pete was having none of that stuff. And when we started looking at the physical intervention side or the restraint stride, whatever you want to call it, PMBA, I don't know, you know, 
we actually realized that 80% of interventions, when we were looking at organizations' instant report forms, only required 20% of the techniques that they were being taught in a training program. Now, I don't mean our training program, because at the time we weren't delivering much. We were generally looking at this when I was doing audits. Okay. And then we sat in on a few courses, and we realized that 80% of the ability for people to learn what they need to learn only required 20% of the instruction being given. And a prime example of this was, yeah, and I, I nearly mentioned the organization, but I won't, um, <laughs> government organization, is I was asked to go and look at some training. And I went along with my, my friend, John Stedman. And the trainer was delivering the training, very good. And he said, right, you know, uh, um, here's a technique. I want you to do this. You grab like this. Your, your left foot leads, your right foot stays there, and you grab the arm and you do that. Brilliant. Then he said this. He said, well, what some of you will do is you put your right foot forward. Don't put your right foot forward, use your left foot forward. If I see you putting your right foot forward, I'm going to come down on you like a ton of bricks because you mustn't put your right foot forward. Now, if you think about this, because they're all students on a course, they're now more worried about getting it wrong than getting it right. Absolutely. And he turned around to John and I and he went, do you know what? Some of those dopes will actually get it wrong. And we said, yeah, we know you just instructed them to do it. You know, <laughs> And they did. So when, when we started looking at this, and this is where the NLP came in in terms of structure of language and positive reinforcement, we actually thought, why would you instruct someone to do something you don't want them to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, in certain cases, it might be required. For example, you know, if, if you're doing really hazardous stuff, you, you might want to say, you know, don't use this particular tool and drill through a wall and, and get a cable to so check the cables. Get that. Mm -hmm. You know, and within our training programs, and, or, and I say ours, I mean everyone's in the community, you, you want to talk about certain techniques that increase the risk of death. You know, mm -hmm. So you might want to make them aware of that, but you wouldn't make that a major aspect of the program you know you need to focus on what they need to do so when we started peeling back the layers of the onion we realized that a lot of stuff that was being taught was totally unnecessary and we came down to 20 percent functionality which fits with this principle so 80 percent of instruction we found was inefficient and unproductive you know whereas 20 percent is productive and got people doing stuff so then we started to look at training program and we thought well hang on there was there was actually a twenty day course out there for instructors when I, when I first started. 20 days. 20 20 days. Days. Yeah, there was a twenty day course, okay. and we looked at this and I thought, right, so this is four weeks, four working weeks. What right. what's happening in four working weeks? And when we looked at it, and at the request of the organisation, we said, you know what, there's a lot of stuff in here that just doesn't need to be taught. I think there was over one hundred and thirty techniques that they were teaching. You know. 130. 130 years it was way over 130 techniques and we thought well why are you teaching so many techniques and combined with the fact that the, a lot of the instruction was you know ineffective and inefficient what if we took the techniques out that people don't need what if we made the training more efficient and that's how we came to a five-day course you know that that's one of the, the, the ways we got there and the other thing we worked on was this this rule occam's rule okay. and it was used so many times this is a you know, 14th century monk devised this you know and he used it so many times, it became to be known as Occam's Razor. And it basically says, is elegance is the least number of steps that it, you know, it, it takes to get you from A to B. So the, you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line sort of thing. Indeed. And then you know, they use this, this wording here, that plurality should not be put, posited without necessity. I can't even say that. You know, but ba basically, it means you know, why complicate stuff? You know, why add more to something if it's not necessary to do it? So if you break this down, the principle basically gives precedence to simplicity uh, of, you know, it's of, of two com competing theories. Uh, the simpler explanation of an entity is the one to be preferred. And it's also expressed as the fact that entities are not to be multiplied beyond necessity, which in language that you and I understand, Travel, is keep it simple, stupid, you know? So well, it's a kid's principle. Yeah. And, you know, and when I you know, was, was doing a, an interview with Ginger Johnson and Ginger's hugely respected in the industry, you know, we were talking about what physical intervention te techniques should be required in a closed protection world. Mm -hmm. He said you need absolutely simple techniques for, for very, very basic reasons because, you know, if it's going to come down on you, you need very simple stuff to do that you can remember. So it's easy to learn, easy to remember, easy to recall and easy to teach. And I think, you know, that's always been why we've been able to do it. Now, don't get me wrong, you know, our five-day course, and if you, you look at the testimonies on there, it blows people's minds, and I'm not saying this to, to try and blow smoke up my backside. It blows mm -hmm. people's minds because of the way it changes the, the way they look at learning. You know, that's the key thing. Uh, and it works extremely well. We've been running this now for 20 odd years, you know, and the, the feedback on it is tremendous. And a lot of the stuff we get told is it's so simple. It's so simple to do that it can't necessarily go wrong. So that's how we sort of 
got our course down to to a five day course and of course right. there's lots of pre-course learning they need to do as well and we give them lots of post-course support we give them all the stuff they need to do so they haven't got a way and build anything you know when they train with us we can all the documentation all, all the presentations everything they need it's business in a box really you know but we we help them as much as we can so they can actually follow a, a structured process of learning and development uh, no thank you for that Mark. but i think there's a couple of things really one uh just want to kind of share an example as well for myself of kind of going through that transition and plus ask your question post that but the question i want to ask you is that a combination of what was some of the resistance you received then going from let's say a 15 or a, certainly a, a longer than five day course and what were some examples if you can of some of the techniques that you may be removed but just before we get to that um for example back in the mid 90s and as uh, as people probably aware but just as a reminder uh, that's when I became introduced into police training. I mm. went to Kent Police in 94 and, and we were doing a Taijutsu tai then. Oh, so yeah, yeah. You know, base, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we had the transition into defensive tactics and to where we are now, for example, uh, and across all strands, by the way. But um, if I think about handcuff training when it first came in across from the States, then you may recall, and I must be honest, um, and you may have to correct me here, wasn't it something like about either 28 or 32 techniques that were first introduced into the program? Oh, it was it massive, wasn't it? Yeah, it's a significant range of techniques. And actually, as a matter of fact, so sprung to you, the basis of the technique was if somebody does this, then you do X, Y, and Z. You know, and I'm just thinking about the fact that if somebody does that, which in itself is not a good start point to teach a technique mm -hmm. in itself. But, you know, the point going back to the, you know, the principles you went through there, you know, and I think a, an element of that, and, you know, uh, and, and I appreciate your view on it, was it some of the hangover from the transition from martial arts, which we kind of started to drop, as I say, in the mid to late 90s to go on to start into it was a slow transition to you know to simplify what we do to know. yeah I, I think the, the part of that's um true i also think the americans are and i don't mean any disrespect to american yeah. cousins, but they see everything as a threat you know yeah. you know so if, they, if they're going to stop someone and, and they're doing conflict management which is one of my greatest things that i love to, to, to mention is you know when we're doing conflict management, we put our hands out like this to show we're non-aggressive They'll put one hand out and they'll be unclipping their gun, you know. So there's, there's a mixed message there. So they, and Tony Bleak and I spoke about this the other day, and Tony was saying they see everything as a threat. So I think part of that was the way they structured their training, and I think it did come from a martial arts background. But to be fair, all use of force training has, has found its roots somewhere in a, in a martial art. A comment. Yeah. But one of the things that, um, uh, you know, we uncovered in the early days was we were asking the question, why is it so prescriptive? So if someone grabs you here, why is there a technique for this? And if someone grabs you here, why is there a, a prescriptive technique for that? Even to the extent of trainers saying, well, your thumb has to be in this position precisely. And if you get it there, it's wrong. We started to look at this and go, why is it so prescriptive? And the only conclusion we could come up, to, up with, having spoke to loads of people about this, was that if someone did the technique wrong, so a member of staff was trained and they did the technique wrong, there was a get out clause for the organization and the training provider by saying, you didn't do the technique as per the manual. And could I just for one moment there, which kind of you know, takes us back a little bit just by way of reflection reference to the issues about approved and non-approved techniques. All right. you know, I don't yeah. particularly want to go down that pathway. I just want to make the reference for links for people who've been following us. So no, we've previously spoken about that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but back to your matter of hand, no, please, mate. Yeah. When does anyone get anything 100% right in, in, in the heat of battle, if you like, you know, when, when they have to go into a situation? Uh, because you're dealing with different motivations as well. So, and again, uh, you know, I've got to thank Pete Boatman for this. You know, he, Pete always said, you know, if someone joins the education sector, they want to be a teacher. They, want to, they probably want to join because they want to help people. They want to, you know, inspire people. They want young children to grow and become something of themselves. It's nowhere in the job description does it say, oh, by the way, as part of that, you're going to do some physical intervention and roll around the floor with violent pupils. You know, they wouldn't sign up. Definitely. And you get healthcare professionals, you know, uh, uh, you know, I know some wonderful women, you know, grandmothers, mothers, you know, in the healthcare sector. They, they genuinely went in there because they want to look after people. You know, and then all of a sudden they find themselves in there and they're on a restraint course. And they're thinking, hang on, I, I, you know, I don't want to do this. There's no motivational drive for this, you know. So I think there's the prescriptive aspect of this came around because in the early days, I think a lot of the training was provided by the police. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The police were following the very prescriptive model that came over initially from the States. Mm -hmm. And it was very much, you know, precede and antecedent. So if someone does this, you will do this. And then if they do that, you will do that. And that became the tick box element to say that you've gone through all these pre-prescribed moves. And I, you know, that really was the defense for the training provider and the organization. Now, don't get me wrong, we use audit sheets as well. You know, we, we make sure that we, we check what everyone does. But we try to move away from being 
prescriptive as opposed to being inclusive. Uh, mm-hmm. An example of this is, you know, in the early days, we had people come on courses with us that, and we said, right, we're going to do the seated technique. When they say, right, we say, show me what you, mm-hmm. you know, because you know this from consultancy, show us what you know and we'll work from there. Yeah. And they were doing mad stuff like sticking their legs out to the side and putting their backsides in and it's real. And we, we had to stop them. We said, listen, you're going to put your back out doing that. What, why do you sit down like that? No one sits down like that. They said, well, that's when you're sitting down during restraint, that's what you have to do. <laughs> we said, and this is NLP, you know, NLP again, NL, NLP talks about inclusion. So if something happens, you include it. So, so we used to ask the question, we say, how many times have you sat on a chair in your life? Oh, thousands. Right. So we'd line up three chairs or a couch. We get them in threes. And we say, three of you sit down. And they sit down. So stand up. Sit down. Stand up. So they're easy enough. Yeah. Right. Hold the person in the middle. Right. All three of you sit down. All three of you stand up. And then we get the, you know, the million dollar question was, yeah, but what if we're standing up and they don't want to sit down? How do we force them to sit down? We, you don't. You stay stood up. You know, why is there an urgency all of a sudden to make someone sit down when they don't want to sit down? That makes the force unnecessary. So you're back to basic principles again. You know. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm trying my best not to laugh here. <laughs> I can't help myself. It's, yeah. Um, but there was a point there, back on a serious note. You know, as you say, the kind of transition across from America, because you mm. may recall as well, their framework, well, not all, but a lot of their framework was around the continuum of force, force continuum. That's right, yeah. The axis and the track, you know, the track. Which yeah, again, yeah. from an objective, an object introduction into the subject, I think is a decent framework to use. Mm. But if you look at it in operational context, because of the flexibility and the fluidity, as we're, dis- as we're discussing and alluding to, then I think the, co- the continuum is too rigid. It's far too rigid. It? Yeah, I, I'd agree with that, you know, because it's, it, it's removing from people their discretion to use their judgment in situations, because no two situations will be 100% the same. You know, so you've got to train staff so they, they understand what they can and can't do. But within that, build in the ability for them to use their judgment and discretion when they have to. And I, and I think a lot of these very strict models that came out were designed to remove that discretion from people. On the, and it was a misconception that if, if, we, if we tell them exactly what to do and then they don't do it, you know, then we can discipline them because they haven't followed the, the, the procedure, if you like. But it became too prescriptive. Yeah. And I also think that academia started to creep its way in a little bit too much in those stages. For example? Well, you had people, um, you know, there's, there's a need for, for people to work at an academic level, I get that. But you had people without any frontline experience or so far removed from frontline experience writing papers about stuff that they knew nothing about. You know, they'd never had All right. the, the physical, emotional engagement in this stuff. And, you know, I mean, I, I can talk about one that someone put out um, a paper saying that there's no need for I think it was dynamic pressurized training because there's no evidence to show that dynamic pressurized training works and I thought hang on a minute you know there is evidence because when I was in the navy we we had to you know go into a mock-up of a ship that was being flooded and we had to repair the holes and I know from your background when you were in the military you had to go and do exercises you know some with live firing to to inoculate you against the stress Yes. So how all of a sudden is there someone writing an academic paper to say there's no evidence for this? Well, there's probably no evidence from it from an academic point of view because, you know, no one bothered to write an academic paper about it. But then they quote on their website, we've never had an injury on any of our training courses when we do restraint. Well, of course you're not going to have an injury. You know, you, you're not training them properly. You know, you're an academic. <laughs> well, then let's, let's look at it then from the other side of that, though, because as we all acknowledge, you know, post-incident, you know, let's just say the person who we've had to use the restraints on, you know, it's necessary, et cetera. Then, you know, to a degree, we want, we want some of their views, don't we, about the way they've restrained, et cetera. Yeah. You know, there's also feedback into the training. But what I want to get to as well, though, from the other side of this, what's your view on, whilst we want to acknowledge their point, their feelings and their points of view and feed that back into the training, but do you have any views on, like, how, how we might accommodate that within the training and how much of that we may accommodate into the training? You're talking about people that have actually been... Yeah people, yeah, people have been restrained, exactly. Yeah. All right, they, they, have a, they have a name for that now. It's called an expert by experience. Uh, and explain to me, please, what an expert by experience is. I think right. I'm what you mean. Well, an expert by experience is someone who has been subjected to, let's talk about restraint. So they've been restrained by staff in a, in a care home or in a hospital or in a psychiatric ward or mental health unit, whatever. So mm-hmm. they've you know, been the person that's been restrained. 
And I think it's a good thing to have their view, you know, because we want views from people who've experienced what it's like to be restrained. I get that. But I also think that there is too much emphasis put on that now. You know, it, we're, we're moving, we've got to be very careful how we manage this because what's happening is experts, my experience, are being listened to far more than staff with experience. So you've got competent staff who are trained staff and trainers who are doing this every day mm-hmm. um, and have gone through a structured process of learning and development. You know, they, they're doing this every day. Um, but more weight in some cases, not all, in some cases has been given to the person who's been affected by the restraint. Now I know this is a probably a political hand grenade with everything that's going on out there at the moment, you know, with George Lloyd and everything else. And we're probably going to get some flack on this, but I think we need to look at this, you know, in a very mature and and subjective way, Mm -hmm. because without wanting to be flippant about this, if an expert by experience was a benchmark, you know, I'm ex Royal Navy, you know, I'd be an alcohol. I'll be an alcoholic consultant. I'd be a sexologist, and I'd be a brawler consultant. You know, <laughs> because it's what, it's what you did. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, and it's the same thing. But I, I want to put it in a context. You know, if 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 I'm walking down the road with headphones in and I'm not paying attention to my surroundings and I step off the curb and I get hit by a car, you know, does that make me a road traffic safety expert? I, I don't think so. You know, so yes, we want to understand their views. Yes, we want to know how it's impacted them from a psychological aspect, so people can can do the right thing by that and maybe build that into the program to reduce restraint. But and here's this is just my take on this. You know, um, so I'll probably I'll probably get loads of hate mail on this one now. We've got a situation where we've got academics talking about a subject they don't do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, follow that. And I've been following this for a while, and when the academics come up with their theory or their mm-hmm. position on this, and they put it out to the people that know about this, and Eric and I spoke, spoke about this on, on another thing, if, if what they're hearing back doesn't fit with their utopia, they won't listen. Right. So they bring an expert by experience who will listen to them, and that academia and, and the expert by experience become their, their, their you know, suit of armor, if you like, where, well, I can't be wrong, because I've got a qualification and look what happened to this poor person here when they were restrained. But the other side of the coin is not being heard. You know, yeah. the staff are dealing with every day because they are experts by experience by the very fact that they're having to do it every day. And some of these staff don't want to do it. You know, like we said earlier on, they didn't join the care sector or the education sector or the nursing sector to restrain people. That, that was something they found out after they got the job. So what, what would be your views then around, um, let's say a new induction course for new starters. And then we, we've learned the methodologies and principles of the restraint techniques, then putting it together in a scenario appropriate to the environment. Yeah, I'm sure. That's where the real measurement of learning is going to come into play. Well, part of the measurement of learning will come into play when you do your, your, your dynamic st- stimulation training. Because yeah. the only way you're gonna inoculate staff for the stresses they're gonna experience when they do it first time is to give them as real as experience as you can. Yeah. But having said that, you've got to look at you know, how long you've got staff for. Yep. Mm-hmm. So if you've got staff on a, on a two day or three day course, cause that's all the organization can release them for mm-hmm. how real can you make it realistically within that time period so that you, you don't injure them, harm them or cause them any stress within the training period, you know? Mm-hmm. So part of it is that, but also part of that is, is how they're supervised, how, how they're given additional instruction at work, how the debriefs go on, how they look at the incident reports and build that back into the training. So the refresher training, you know, it evolves over time. The training program evolves over time. And you've done this. I know you've done this successfully. And, you know, we've done it. And in nine years, we were on version 13 or 14 of a training program because of the information we got back. And, yes, we did talk to experts by experience, who people who've been restrained as well, to get of that course. input in, you know. But it was balanced in the right way. Hmm. But then, you know, you, you say you're on version, uh, I think, 13, you said there? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 13 or 14 we're on, yeah. So we come back to then, you know, and just say there's X number of uh, techniques in your training. Well, there are X number of techniques in your training program. I don't know the number. But then if we're going back to an organization and doing recertification, upskilling, et cetera, et cetera, to themselves, and we're getting part of that review, what are your views? And if they've got, let's say they had nine techniques, I'm just using purely hypothetical, mm. yeah? And they've only used seven of those techniques and they've got evidence about seven they've used and there's two they haven't used significantly or at all over that 12 month period. What would be your view in terms of feedback to them and how you might take the training forward then? Oh, if there's evidence that they're not using the techniques, mm. take them out of the program. Yeah. Okay. You know, it comes back to basic risk assessment. If you're doing a risk assessment and you've now identified something as being a low risk, 
a low risk from, from a risk assessment point of view says no further action. Nothing needs to be done. <laughs> the problem um, we have, uh, or we've had, uh, certainly in the early days, and you know this, mm -hmm. is where, and I've come across this numerous times, where a training provider has said, well, you can't take any techniques out because you know, it, it will make the course not legally defensible. Yeah, right. So when I've been called into, you know, there's an incident or it's an expert witness report or whatever, you know, you get called in and you're trying to help the organization like you do. And they say, well, we've got this training program and we've got X number of techniques, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Uh, you look at the incident reports and you do exactly what you say and you say, well, why have you got these techniques in, you know, the staff, I can't see evidence of staff are getting grabbed or assaulted like that, or there's a need for it from a service user or patient point of view. They say, no, no, it doesn't happen. We'll take them out. Oh, we can't take them out. Why? Well, the training providers told us if they take them out, it won't be legally defensible. The system won't be legally defensible. Right. Well, how does that work? You know, so I, I tend to say, okay, well, imagine you're in court. Mm -hmm. Someone's been seriously injured or harmed or died. And you're now being cross-examined by a barrister in, 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 a, in, a, in a court. And that barrister says to you, right, um, the member of staff that's employed by you in this situation couldn't remember how to do the technique properly. Um, and that resulted in this injury or fatality. Um, what, and they say to the member of staff, why couldn't you remember? Well, it's, uh, we've got so many techniques, you know, it's confusing to try and remember them all, you know, and, and yes, I made a mistake and the, they hold their hands up. Sure. The next question to the organization is why have you got techniques in there that you're not using? Right. You know, and if the management's answer to that is, well, if we take them out, it's not legally defensible. I think any barrister is going to rip through that with a knife through butter because how can it be legally defensible to give someone something they don't need? Yeah. If, if it's, and they can say that that's the legal requirement. It, does, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. You know, I mean, when I go shopping and you go shopping, yeah. I don't buy everything in the bloody supermarket just in case I might need it one day. It's the stuff I know I'm not going to eat, the stuff I know I'm not going to use, the stuff I know I'm never going to buy. You know, so you can't be dictated to by a training provider. It, there's got to be a partnership approach to this. People have got to work together. You know, it, what's it called, Trev? Training needs analysis. Absolutely, all day long. I'm trying my best not to laugh out loud. <laughs> but the sad thing is, it is laughable when, when you look at it objectively, mm. but it's also bloody dangerous. And sadly, it's occurring more than probably you and I even realise, quite sadly. So, but within that, then, let's come then to some areas around high risk techniques. Yeah, right. let's really go controversial. Yeah, and maybe, yeah, shall I go there? Cool, yeah, go there, mate. Techniques on the ground? Yeah. Ground techniques. Yeah, ground techniques. Let's go there. Why not? What the hell? Yeah. yeah. And some of the issues aren't there around, you know, and, you know, any high risk, but ground techniques, yeah? And again, you know, without trying to get caught up with what's happening in America, but we're just looking at purely from a technique perspective, we know there's a lot of discussions going on. But, you know, the controversial issue, isn't it? A lot of places where, we go back to again, they've got the evidence to say that people are being restrained on the ground mm. themselves. Uh, you spoke about it recently about people, oh, you and Eric, I think it was, people are calling it by another name. Yeah. Oh, emergency uh, escape and rescue techniques or thank something. You. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, you know, and that, that's a separate discussion within itself, really, um, which is something I'm struggling with. But the fact then, you know, if there's a need and we've got the evidence basis to say that, you know, um, all of the measures are failing and we need to control something on the ground then some of the some of the principles we need to um, include when de when dealing with that yeah and i think yeah. you know, i come to you know the placing of i'm going to say the knee stroke the lower le the lower part of the leg you know anywhere between the knee and the shin yeah right so, and what are some of your views maybe around that then in terms of where you place the knee i'm going to for me i'm going to put it out there just as a kind of intro yeah because we've got the issues around the neck we've got the issues around the spine yeah You've got the issues around because of the technique itself, then it might be, you know, potentially high risk about restrict, possibly restricting on the breathing thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it comes down to the management of the risk, you know? Mm. So I know, I know, and you know, cause we've got colleagues that we've known for years, they're working with very high risk people in their care. And, you know, in one case, and, uh, and I'll, I'll speak about it without naming anything that when, when they had to unlock one person, I think it was a six person unlock because that person would come at you and they would go to bite your nose off and gouge your eyes out. So they were grabbed. They were put straight on the floor in a face down or prone position and their hands were handcuffed behind their back and then they were stood up. Yeah. You know, there was no other way they, they could manage that. And, you know, they got their risk assessment and, play, and everything in, in, in place. So mm -hmm. that's required and all the safeguards in place there. With regards to where you put the knee, mm -hmm. you know, we all know that putting people face down or in prone doesn't kill them 
Yeah. You know, Tony Bleakman spoke about it on the video the other day. We're putting COVID yeah. patients in pain. It doesn't kill them. Exactly. What kills them is what you do to them when they're in that position. You know. <laughs> now, if, if you're going to put your knee on someone's neck, all right, so we, we weren't going to go with George Floyd, but this is a key thing. Yeah. If you're going to put a knee on someone's neck, with all the evidence out there uh, that, and the research that's been done that shows that putting pressure on someone's neck will stop them breathing, trigger the vagus nerve, you know, damage the carotid sinus, interrupt the blood flow to the brain, all the stuff we know, basics, shouldn't be done. Yeah. It's, you, it, we're in the 21st century, there's got to be a safer way. You know? And part of the work we did with one organization, when we looked at, when we took over the, the training, they had a lot of, lot of incidents of, of face down and prone restraint. Indeed. And in fact, I think four days of a training course was spent training people how to deal with face down and prone restraints. Four days? Yeah, yeah. So we actually got, we spoke to the staff and we said, what would be a better solution for you? Because staff were getting injured as well. We remember trying to do this. Indeed. We said, what would be a better solution for you? They said, well, we don't want to go there. So we said, well, when they go to the ground, why don't you just let go? <laughs> and, it was, and it was like, initially it was a, are you mad? We went, oh, no. <laughs> Because for someone to fight you, they've got to get up off the ground. Yeah, and as they're getting up, you could re-engage. Yeah. But there's also, with some vulnerable people, possibly attachment issues. They yeah. like being restrained yeah. in certain positions. So it's, it's testing it and seeing it. So we, you know, the staff came up with this idea. that let's, And we had one ward that was still using restraints on the floor. And this, this other ward said, no, we're going to let them go. The ward that let them go had less issues and less injuries than the war that was continuing to doing it because all we had with this was a custom and practice model that had never been evaluated and never been tested and never been amended and, and changed and i remember that the hospital manager of the ward uh, one day saying to me that she she rang me up and she said this is really hilarious she said i've got to tell you this much she goes we restrained the patient he went to the ground and we disengaged he got up we grabbed it he came towards us we grabbed hold of him again for his own safety he went to the ground we disengaged mm. He said he shuffled off on his backside on the floor going, well, if you're not going to restrain me down here, I don't see any point in it. <laughs> she said, it's made me think about this from a completely different you know, paradigm. Yeah. So it's looking at, you know, should we just be doing what we've always done? Because if it's the old saying, you do what you've always done, you get the same results. People will continue to die. Indeed. There's equipment out there. You know, there's belts, there's safety pods. You know, we introduced all of this to, to our organizations and it reduced the, the need for floor restraints dramatically, you know. And I think there's a fear, you know, because I remember someone saying to me, Mark, if you, know, if you bring all this stuff in and they don't need this training, your training is going to be cut back, you lose business. So I think there's a fear that people think, well, hang on, you know, if we reduce restraint too much, we might not have any work left. That's what restraint production is about. You know, I would rather not be teaching people to restrain anyone, to be honest with you. You know, there's other things I can do with my life, you know. Um, so I think there's a lot of bias in, in, in certain, certain areas and in certain mindsets, which you know, I'm sad to say, are rigid and fixed and because it's always been done that way we have to do it that way and we're not prepared to change but well i mean you know as a human race we were, we've evolved to what we are now everything evolves computers evolve you know the way we the way we interact with people evolve i mean covid changed the way we interact with people you know, things, things ch everything changes systems have to change you know that's why it's called a system so you have systematic processes that can be evaluated monitored and changed and amended to make the system more efficient and you go back to occam's rays what we started talking about at the beginning you've I'm done this though there's so many things in their systems and processes uh restraint reduction ironically sorry <laughs> and there are so many factors in there and just one thing for me and uh just to remind people you know although we're talking about high risk techniques you know we also we do subscribe to the fact that tech needs to be safe during training needs to be safe first then effective you know we know that but just a reminder to everybody else out there so those principles and resources need to be in place as well no i think that's very, i think that's a very important point Can we expand on that a bit more because i think you've, you've touched on something that's really important that people need to know about well uh, you know if i can just pick up from the thread then you know uh, whilst we've got a realistic need let's just say you know maybe to restrain somebody on the ground then mm. we come back to you know and you've heard the term i've heard it often enough you know reality-based training training needs to be fit for purpose <laughs> and uh, you know uh, you know somebody doesn't need to feel pain to know that it hurts doesn't it? a particular technique or somebody punching you hitting etc we don't need that at all yeah so whilst we work you know whilst certain people work in very extreme very high risk areas and for you the crude analogy if you think about a traffic light system you know mm. it's a red zone risk freeze and discussion yeah the training has still got to be safe firstly and foremostly yeah, within itself from there yeah, yes, we need mats, you know, because I've been to lots and lots of places and they should remain nameless where yeah, we want, you know, we need some ground restraint techniques or just straight controlling down to the ground. Okay, fine, then let's bring the mats out then. We haven't got any mats. 
So we're doing training down to the ground. You already know that it's pre-planned, but we've got no resource and equipment to cover it. Training must be safe. It's got to be safe first, then effective. So if it means if we have to taper the training down, then we must do so. Let's come back to some issues we talk about duty of care. Let's just pick up on one thing you said, though. Well, you know you said when they're training, if you're going to take someone down, it's got to be safe, we're going to use mats. Yeah. Well, it's just going through my head. Right. They're training for that because they're going to do that in, in the workplace. Yeah. They're going to have mats in the workplace. <laughs> no, they're not going to have mats in the workplace, no. So the training's safe, yeah. but the operational application of that may not be safe. Fair point, yeah. So I, I go back to the first principle is, do you need to do that in the first place? Because, yeah. Yeah. you know, because I know some systems, even with the elderly, they teach this forced restraint to the floor. It's shocking. Yeah? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. You know, and they say, well, take elderly people to the floor. Why? You know, they got, they, their structures are not as solid as ours, and they take them down with force. Hmm. So you're going to get injuries. So I would look at eliminating that. And, and this is one way, not every way. Right. So say, well, what would you do if they were really struggling? And, and, they, and, and they, they talk about this patient led descent to the floor. How's it a patient led descent to the floor? Well, they're making us go to the floor. How are they making you go to the floor? Well, we can't control them. So you're in a restraint you can't control. No, why can't you control them? Because the technique's ineffective. Put a wrist lock on them. That will stop them going to the floor. And I demonstrate it because I put a wrist lock on the biggest person in the group and they, they can't go to the floor because the pain's too much. But then they say, well, you can't put a wrist lock on them because that's pain and, and, and that's illegal and that's abuse. Yeah. Okay, so having other techniques that are ineffective that means the patient leads the descent to the floor and then you all fall down with him on a hard surface and then restrain him on the floor and that's not abuse and that's not harmful it's warped well let's go, let's go forward to come back you know we're at the point of haven't we you know we've bypassed the fact that verbal communication and non-verbal has failed so we've now got you know we've now physically intervened having physically intervened we're now at the stage of we haven't got control of the person so we've still got two options i appreciate we've got that much decision time but we've still got two options you've already touched on one let go of them safe separation yeah yeah. But if in the moment we decide that's not an effective technique in that moment, we need to keep hold of them, then if we can't control them up, standing up, then we may have to just, I'm going to say, take them off balance to begin with. Let's do it in stages, yeah? Mm. But if, if we either A, take them off balance and it's still not working, or, for, you know, due to the pressure and the urgency, et cetera, and the need, we decide to control them to the ground. The point we're both saying, we're controlling them to the ground. <laughs> yeah, they're not going down. Or oh, the third option, the third not option, the third element could be, they've decided to take themselves to the ground and take us with them, if you follow. Yeah. yeah. That's not a control, is it? that's you know, a reverse situation. But those, those, you know, we still have those choices. We may only have fractions of seconds to make those choices, yeah, but we've still got the opportunity to make the right decision in that moment. Yeah. Well, here, here, Go on. Here's, here's one for you, like, do you remember in, I think it was in, on, it was in April 2014, the Department of Health, of Health brought out that positive and protective care document. <laughs> yeah, we have. And in there, it said there could be no planned or intentional restraint of a person to the floor. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yes, I do. Well, we got asked to go in and provide some training for an organization, and they'd done training with someone else. So we said, look, just show us what you do. You know, we're not here to change your world. We just want to help you improve it. Mm. And they started doing a planned restraint to the floor. So we stopped them. We said, well, what are you doing? They, we said, the document advises against doing a planned take down to the floor why are you doing a planned take down to the floor and they said this i'll never forget it they said no no this is not a planned takedown yeah this is a planned descent to the f uh, what's it no hang on it's it's a planned descent for a patient-led unplanned descent to the floor or worse that effect we said, well, I said what, what does that mean yeah they said well we're, we're not planning to take to the floor the patient's leading the the the, the, the descent I said so but you're training it yeah so you're training something as a planned intervention then you can't say this is not something you can foresee they went no no, no. it's an un oh, it's, a, it's an unplanned descent for, for it's, it's a planned descent for an unplanned descent to the floor i said it doesn't make sense i said it's either planned or it's not and they went yeah but we have to put it in there just in case we said well you're either planning it or you're not planning it we said don't do it you know don't do it help them down let them go they said they'll get back up again to grab them yeah. i said be what they go down again let them go and then you incorporate other things like equipment and everything else but it's changing a mindset sometimes but you can't change a name to make something right you know and we have this in our world you know people change the name of techniques you can't call it this and you can't call it that so you come up with emergency whatever it's called emergency response techniques or something uh, yeah. 
But it also doesn't, it? Uh, you know, and we haven't said it out loud, but one of the factors is that there's too many techniques in there, isn't it, in themselves, that it takes away the individual's autonomy in that moment to manage the situation. Yeah. Because they're too busy trying to reflect on in the moment, isn't it? What does this range of techniques say I must do in this given situation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which just cannot be right to themselves. But I think as well, just touching, you know, and you, you know, you refer back to the document there, you know, 2014 document. But remember as well, with it coincided, not coincided, within there was this, the ruling about you can only keep somebody down on the ground for X number of minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'll say an X number, was it th three or 10 in my head? Forgive me, I can't remember exactly now, but it was a given period, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was, it was uh, 10 minutes and then um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the medication had to be administered. Um, or if the medication couldn't be administered, then it didn't say what you do next, but it implied you're supposed to let go of them, if you, if you recall. I, I'm vague. Around. It was either you had to seclude them or medicate them or let go. I can't remember. Yeah, ten, 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 yeah. Came up with this thing of ten minutes. Ten minute rule. And we had the same thing with Rocky Bennett, didn't we? I think they had a three yeah. minute rule then. Yeah, three minutes. That's where the three minute comes in. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Where did it come from? Uh, well, from and I like I'm reflecting now, but I, I think it was <laughs> certainly wasn't directly attributed to physical intervention and managing behaviour. Yeah. So although it was some kind of scientific basis. I'm going to say it was more kind of sports science related rather than physical intervention related, certainly. And I, 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 and again, something we might have to kind of go back and do some rereading on and maybe come back here. Yeah. Mm. But I mean, in answer to your question, I have to be honest, I'd have to reflect back on it unless you, unless you have any recall. As far as I'm aware, it's made up. Right. Okay. I asked, I asked the question directly at a conference to, to um, one of the academics that was involved with these panels. And um, I think Eric was with me at the time, Eric Baskin, that we pushed the question and someone said, well, we were running out of time at the meeting. So it was very much a finger in the air to come up with the time period. All right. Well, I don't feel so bad then about struggling to recall where it came from then, because yeah. that was going to make sense. You know, that, that's what I recall from it. My memory might not be as good as it was, but, you know, how can you put a time period on a position in a restraint because there's so many variables in there that you know you've got the variables of pressure you've got the variables of the position you've got the variables of person's health you've got the you know so many different variables you know temperature conditions i mean you know we we lost people in the prison service who were restrained on the floor because of hypothermia yeah 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 yes yes yeah because you know most of the floors in the prison <laughs> are, are cold you know a child you just come with a violent struggle their mm. body core temperature goes up you put them on the floor and they cool down faster than they should you got you got a hypothermic response to that and they identify this as being a being a problem mm. you know so there's so many different variables and then uh, but what the thing which gets me is people aren't keeping up to up to speed on stuff uh, i remember in the early 90s you remember this remember when they they, they sent a memo out in the prison service that i was in at the time saying when, when you're restraining people of black and certain ethnic origins, be mindful of the fact that they have sickle cell anemia. You're going there, yes. Yeah, which is the sickling of the red blood cells, which makes them inefficient in carrying oxygen around the, the, their body. Mm. And therefore, they're more at risk of getting positioned or fixing anyone else. And the prison service dealt with that, and we did that in training. It was brilliant. Years later, and I'm talking 10 years later, I'm sitting watching Newsnight, and some poor person had died in a restraint. And they said, yeah, but we've now found out about sickle cell anemia. Mm. Thing, hang on we were told this 10 years i was on the phone to newsnight saying to them get me on this program because they haven't just found out about it they've known about this for 10 years mm -hmm. so why was it never implemented as training i mean the police were the first to talk about um what's it called um excited delirium or excited delirium yeah, yeah exciting well i was going to yeah thank you because i was going to bring that point up because interestingly and uh the fact that you know, i'm linked in with eric and a case uh a fatal accident inquiry i a hearing but they call them mm. FAA, FAA is up in scotland yeah uh we were involved in yeah 2018 yeah two years july 2018 where the issue about excited delirium came up and you know without going into too much detail but there wasn't there was very limited reference within the manual of guidance yeah and certainly I, both Eric and I were asked the question and I referred back to, well, I can remember this training being covered and I'm going to say 2001, i.e. somewhere between 1999 and 2001, we were covering excited delirium. But there we were in 2018 as though it was a brand new concept coming into training. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, it, again, it begs the question, almost what's that, about a 20 year void? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why is it then, that, you know, in one area we seem to be covering it and addressing it could be doing more well we've caught up a lot now as we know but another area it seems to be completely devoid of that program mm. you know, particularly when there were both institutions around one was police one was prison yeah yeah you know, yeah i think i certainly believe there's a lot of parallels there i mean i'm sure people have a comment on that but i think there are significant parallels in the techniques that are used 
Yeah. yeah, and you know, going back to Dr. John Park's research from Coventry mm -hmm. University about restraint positions and lung function, you know, he and he spoke at our conference and we videoed it all. And at the end of it, he said, "I want to leave you with one thing and remember this: it's called the breathing talking fallacy." You know, if someone's <laughs> yeah. saying, "I can't breathe," "I can't breathe," he said, "They actually are struggling for breath." But a lot of people equate that to, "Well, if you if you're talking, you must be able to breathe." And that was endemic in, you know, George Lloyd's case, as it was in Jimmy Mabenga's case. And as it's been in so many cases, you know, uh, you know, white and black and all colors. You know, I've, I've been involved in various expert witness cases where people have been held on the ground and said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Mm. And they die because people believe that if they're, if they're talking, they're breathing. You know, it's, it's shocking. But, and there's got to be an element of, I, say, I was going to say compassion, but common sense although common sense is not as common as we like to think. Mm. Because I was talking to a, a minister a while ago, and he said, look, we were talking about, you know, uh, it was an interesting meeting. There, there, there were psychologists there and all sorts of stuff talking about why people do this. And, you know, it could be because they had a bad upbringing and, it, they, you know, it's not their fault. And, you know, they may have certain problems with serotonin levels in the brain, and dopamine, and it's all getting very technical and everything else. And this old minister said, he said, look, he said, it's quite simple. People know when they're doing right and when they're doing wrong. He said, justifying it doesn't make it right or wrong. He said, people need to know when they're doing right and they're doing wrong. And going back to your point about all of these rigid and flexible training programs, that takes away that discretion for them to know. Because I was involved in one case only last year where a child was held in a basket hold and carried very abruptly out of a classroom, picked up by, by the teacher, dragged across um, a corridor, across a refectory and sat on a couch you can see the torment on the child's face mm. and the child actually dropped to his knees at one point and now you can't see the hands coming up around his neck but from right. the position you know you could imply that that was what was happening because the child actually had bruising around his neck and the doctor's report was it was it was consistent with the technique used but when we asked the teacher why didn't you let him go he said when we do the training if we have to restrain the child that technique we have to get him to that particular sofa really yeah he said that's the training he said and if we don't follow the training he said i get in trouble this is an educated man that's got degrees qualifications and academic and the training provider's probably got less qualifications than him yeah someone has made up a rule that says once you start restraining him it can't finish till you get there that's dangerous you know and it's, i spoke about this i think with tony with, with eric where you've come across this where you had door supervisors and other security staff they <laughs> restrained someone on the ground with this rule in their head that someone's made up that once you've restrained them you can't let them go till the police arrive the police, yeah yes and in the in the case that i was involved with david ivan when the police arrived that poor gentleman was dead uh well i've been in some similar cases yeah one uh, i think it was 20 odd minutes i think you know they'd call the police and yeah the police you know hadn't arrived for 22 minutes yeah i'm sure that, yeah I'm, yeah 22 minutes actually i'm confident it's 22 minutes but they kept hold of that person because the part of their, if you wish, defence around why they kept hold of them was the fact that we'd phoned the police. You know, he, he'd been violent and aggressive. We were waiting to hand him over to the police, even though he was face down on the ground, was not going anywhere. And that I, stopped I, struggling. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, going back to the issue of, of academics, we need them. You know, they, they provide valuable input, like Dr. John Parks has done with his research. You know, um, but I think Tony Bleatman made the point clearly was, you know, when he challenged the police once on, on a case, uh, Pete Boatman, you know, rang him up and basically said to him, uh, you know, nothing about our training, you know, nothing about the operational environments we do. And he said, if you're going to stand up and, and criticize the police, he said, I'm going to shout you down every time. You'll never get any work in there. He said, here's a challenge. You come on a course with me. And, it, and Tony, bless him, went on the course. I think there's more need for people to do that. Yeah. You know inspectors cqc inspectors ofsted inspectors you know how are they meant to know what they're talking about they're supposed to inspect to make sure the restraints not unlawful but they're given no training as we know because we've done a freedom of information request mm -hmm. you know people who, who chair these panels you know or, or the committees of these panels who, who are academics we want your input but we want it from, from a position of understanding yeah come, come down in the trenches and get you know get down and dirty with us and let's do, let's do this let, let you know experience what it's like and then go and work a couple of shifts with people to do this stuff because you know on a, on a whiteboard it's great you know you can put the numbers together and come up with, with a rule but it's dangerous well not just in our training world but in many training you know, any kind of many practical skills training areas isn't it you know what happens in training and what happens in reality sometimes are truly poles apart aren't they you know so the, as you say the theory of course we respect the theory and the theory is a good grounding 
and a sounding board. But then when we put it into reality, the one thing we can't dictate is what the end person will actually do. The subject, if I'm calling the subject, we can't dictate. We may have some, uh, some, pre some analysis, some data, you know, lots of evidence, et cetera, et cetera, about previous behaviors. But we can't guarantee they're going to do exactly the same thing the next time. It just doesn't occur like that. No, because there's so many variables in there. Yeah. There's so many variables. You know, it, it's really, you can't be pre prescriptive with this, you know. Um, yeah, so, I, and the, the other thing, just to finish, I, I think, is, and, I, and I, I, want, I hope this bit helps people. I get a lot of people ring me up that say, look, I've got this idea for a training course, and it's absolutely brilliant because mm -hmm. my buddies and I, we've been X years in doing this and X years doing that with the top of our profession, and this is what the industry needs, and we want to get it out there. And I've heard that so many times from people and, and I've seen so many times that process fail mm -hmm. because if what you think someone needs and what they actually need are two different things, you've got to go and talk to the market will decide, you know, the market will decide what to do. Um, so if anyone is thinking I've got a great idea for a training program, you know, go and go and look at training that's been done and see how you can help people make that better first. And, and then come up with something that can enhance and improve what's already there. Because if someone's not doing something, you know, someone rang me up and say, oh, I've, I've got a great idea for running, opening a training company in this area because no one's doing it. Now that might be an opportunity, but there might be a really valid reason why no one's doing it. It could be that other companies have tried and they've gone bust. So you need to be careful. We're not too biased on what we focus on and we have to take this, you know, objective view on it. But that's, that's, that's the purpose of risk assessment. Mm -hmm. But I think as well within that, as well as the fact that it comes into place, and I go back, you know, we've been talking a little bit about high risk techniques, i.e., you know, restraining on the ground. But let's go back to any restraints, isn't it? As we know, and as we, as we all, you know, certainly you and I, many of our, uh, many of the people we know and respected people we know teach in training, don't they? That any restraint carries a risk of positional asphyxia. Yeah. Because you're taking away somebody's freedom of movement. They want to get away from you, not always, but, you know, not to cause harm, they just want to escape. But if you've got the hold on well, you know, and you're managing to control them, then in many instances, isn't it? if you're standing, you know, excuse me, in the positions off shoulder behind, etc., and they're trying to move forward, then we know the chest cavity wall becomes restricted, doesn't it, within itself? Mm. So that becomes a factor, you know, because I think sometimes people just focus on the fact that whether, you know, whether the face down, whether the seated envelope forward, etc., you know, and I think all restraint carries a potential. Let's keep the risk in perspective, but it carries a potential. And I think one other thing I just want to just mention as well, and you mentioned about, uh, you know, I can't breathe, you know, again, it should be a thread within training, you know, isn't it? We talk about restraint asphyxiation, don't we, as well, you know, so it could occur, couldn't it, in terms of restriction of breathing, lack of oxygen to the brain, either immediately prior to the restraint, during the restraint, or immediately after the restraint. Mm. I think sometimes there's too much of a fixation on, isn't it, the point where we've got hands on, and not always, but sometimes, not enough emphasis, you know, the moments leading up, and the moment post, isn't it? You know, because the body itself isn't the emotional state. Yeah, those those factors need to be key as part of that thread as we're going through. And it, yeah, and this leads on to another point. We're going to go on all day on this trip. <laughs> but people always talk about restraint should be the last option. It should be the last thing you do. Sometimes, do you know what? It's got to be the first thing you do. It, it, you know, it has. And Pete Pete Boatman taught me this. Yeah, we discussed this long and hard. If it's the right thing to do in that circumstances and it's going to it's going to eliminate the risk then it has to be done and you can have a debate about it afterwards you know because if someone's going to jump off a bridge you know i'd want to get them off the bridge yeah i'm going to grab them and pull them back if i can do that you know if i'm if i'm having a three-hour discussion with them and they don't jump off a bridge that's great i'll put the time in to do that but if that person is about to go they're getting pulled back you know and i think there's a lot of emphasis on it must be the last resort last resort last resort last resort if your child was going to step in front of a bus on a, on a fast moving road, mm. you're going to grab them first resort. Yeah. You know, if a child's going to, going to smash his head against the corner of a wall to try and kill himself, I'm, I'm going to restrain him first resort. You know, there needs to be this balance because we're drilling it in as too much of a general rule. You know, and, you know, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to repeat you, but use different words there. Cause you know, it's something I, I I'm always saying this point, isn't it? But you know, if we come to the point where a decision is made where we feel we need to put hands on and restrain somebody, unless we're doing it for a greater good, <laughs> yeah, so we're trying to stop it going wrong before you know, harm occurs, mm. or it's already gone wrong, and we're trying to stop the harm from worsening, unless we're doing it for a greater good or prevent further harm, then you know, I ask my first question is, why are you assaulting that person? Why are you assaulting? You know, if you can't evidence it 
but either or, then why are we doing it? Why mm. are we doing it? You know, so yeah, of course I, I subscribe to the principles of last resort, but as you quite rightly say, sometimes your last resort is your first resort, your only option to manage that situation, stop it worsening. Yeah. You know? But people then, you know, and it comes back, you know, again, the right back to people need autonomy, you know, and I know people, you know, I think I'm, it's not about being soft, it's about empowering people. Sorry, I get a bit worked up with this, but it's about mm. empowering people, it's giving them the autonomy to manage a situation as they believe best and evidencing why they've done what the rationale is. And interestingly, going back to the Pareto principle, the 80 20 rule on this, you know, 80% of a, of, of a training course, as we've already decided, could be inefficient. Mm. Within yes. the 20%, 80% of that 20% that's left must be designed to give people that autonomy by helping them understand things like the law, condition asphyxia, <laughs> you know, all the other things that are important. It's not just techniques. You know, techniques are 20% of the 20%. You know, it's the other stuff. Because I know training programs, they drill and drill and drill a technique. And I get that. You know, when we're in the forces, we have to drill and drill and drill and yeah. drill. I, I get that. But the understanding of when and how you can apply those skills within the framework of a legal framework with it within a best interest criteria, you know, with, with, with the right ethics and morals that gives you, you've got to have an understanding of the whole aspect of what you're doing. Absolutely. So going back to how can we do a course in five days? Well, there's a shed load of stuff people are doing before they get to that five day bit. You know, they, they've got a lot of pre-course learning to do on all the other stuff they've got to learn to come on the course. So we can take that and put this into context, mm -hmm. but it gives people the autonomy to make decisions. Mm -hmm. It's not rigid based, it's not rope based, it's not strict, you know, because you're so right in what you're saying. I mean, could I also as well, I think an area, you know, uh, I'll put it out there now, I think, you know, if we need to have a discussion around, we haven't done it yet, is around the post incident review, but importantly, the reporting. Yeah. You know, because I mean, we've made a lot of reference to it, we've alluded to it a lot every time, but I think it's probably something we need to talk about in a bit more detail. I think we better do that another video because we've been banging on for some. Yeah, time. no, no, indeed, <laughs> indeed, no, fair point. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but no, but it's as always, it's enjoyable. There's so many things to cover and discuss. Um, but you know, as we as we're just coming to a close. Uh, but you know, my, my introductory question was, how do you manage to do the training in five days? You know, well, I'd like to think people have got enough of an insight into your rationale behind it and the fact that the training needs to be fit for purpose based on an organization's evidential needs, which comes back to a training needs analysis. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah my, my question would be, why can't you do a training course in five days? I like that, actually, yeah. I like that. You know, <laughs> because if it's that complicated that you need three weeks or four weeks to train someone, then that would tell me that if it is that complicated, you've got to have that much practice to get it right, hmm. then you've got to simplify your skills. Yeah. Everyone I respect in the industry says it. You say it. Keep it simple, stupid. Jimmy yeah. Johnson, keep it simple. You know, Lofty Wiseman, keep it simple. You know, John Steadman, keep it simple. Pete Turner, keep it simple. Eric, Tony, you, they all sing off the same hymn sheet. Mm -hmm. If it's simple, if you keep it simple, why can't it be done in five days? Well, here's something for you, and you'll, you'll recall this saying. Easy to learn, easy to remember. Yeah. <laughs> God. That's taking me way back. Sorry, it's just coming to my head. That's taking me way back. No, oh, simple. Right, buddy, we better go, because uh, we've been going for an hour. Have we? Oh, gosh. Okay. Yeah. I bet people watching this have been falling asleep, particularly during your bit, but you're boring. <laughs> and you see, there you go. You've done it again. <laughs> well, listen, as always, yeah, very good. Very good. And thank you for giving a good insight into, you know, your, your side of the regime, which, which transfers across to what many of us are doing anyway, with respect. But I think people will get more of an insight. Those who don't know, you know, you're the training regime. Yeah. But I also think they ought to understand that, you know, I've learned a lot from good people, you included. Uh, and, you know, you're asking me the questions, but it's rhetorical, really, because you do exactly what I do. Yeah. You know, so you're doing it anyway. And I think people need to understand that they, they should talk to you about this stuff, too. You know, it, it's so important. Um, and I hope it's been useful. But thanks, mate. And uh, I think we'll, we'll catch up. and we'll, we'll do the next one around the reporting, shall we? And just very one final point. You've mentioned Pete Boltman and like you. Yeah, I mean... I think Pete was, wasn't he? You know, God rest his soul. But we learned, all of us learned so much from Peter. Yeah. And I think it shouldn't be, you know, I think Bungie Williams needs a mention as well because he, yes. he took that torch on. You know, when, when Pete sadly passed, Bungie picked, it, picked up the torch and he carried on running with it. Mm -hmm. Same mindset, same mentality. Good man, you know. Yeah, um, and we need more people like that. And they're out there. They'll come.
Yeah. All right, buddy. Well, Thanks. I'll speak, speak to you soon. All right. Take care. Cheers.